afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's very nice to see such a full room. It's quite rare in a philosophy talk. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you our last keynote speaker, Professor Peter Singer, who needs no introduction. We are delighted to have you here at the University of Porto. Uh, Peter Singer is one of the very few philosophers who has had a major impact on public life in the last decades. Uh, from the times of his animal liberation in 75, which basically started off animal rights movement, to the more recent effective altruism movement, which is in effect an effective altruism uh, community, gathering many people uh, around the world. Through his rights on practical ethical eth ethics things such as abortion, euthanasia, poverty and affluence, uh, Peter Singer has shown over and over the importance of applied ethics. And that's what he's going to talk about today. So, uh, <clears throat> why applied ethics matters, animals and effective altruism. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. and, uh, thank you, Sophia, and thank uh, Stephen, wherever he's got to, um, for uh, having organized this and persuaded me to come to it. I'm very glad to be here and it is, as you say, very nice to see a full room and also you've judged the size of the lecture theatre perfectly, right? There's nobody having to stand, there's a couple of seats, but it's full basically, which is terrific. And I think applied ethics should be, and that's really what I'm trying to say here, um, applied ethics should attract big audiences because it is important and it makes a difference to how we live and it's hard to think of anything more important than that. So I thought in, um, as this was a closing talk after a um, you know, a reasonably long, reasonably full conference. I'm sorry I couldn't be here for all of it because of uh, other prior commitments that I had. But uh, I can see it was a very full program. Um, and I thought maybe towards the end of it, uh, I would say something a little bit broader, a little bit easier to, uh, to assimilate, but also something about applied ethics in general. Um, and I'm going to start by essentially putting this in a context of where applied ethics came from in terms of the um, era, let's say post Second World War philosophy, um, focusing particularly on philosophy in the English language, as that's what I'm most familiar with. Uh, because I think it's really interesting to see uh, that it wasn't always there. Uh, there were people who rejected the idea of applied ethics as a part of philosophy, even though Historically, you can go right back to Socrates and you can see that uh, you know, Plato is talking about applied ethics and uh, so does Aristotle and then it goes on. Um, certainly the, uh, the medievalists are talking about applied ethics. People like Aquinas and uh, Hume and Kant also talk about some uh, applied issues. Uh, but there was a period when um, philosophers didn't want to do that and they thought it wasn't part of philosophy. And that period's not all that long ago. So I thought I'd start by saying a little bit about this. And uh, it may look odd today, given all of the applied ethics that we've just had in the last few days and that you're familiar with from frequent past years. But, um, but it was certainly there. And here's uh, one of the leading statements of this from one of the leading philosophers of the post-war era in, um, to say, in Anglophone philosophy and in, in Britain. Uh, A.J. Eyre, who was, uh, at the time when I was, went to Oxford as a graduate student, which was 69, uh, um, was uh, professor, of, uh, a professor of philosophy, I think maybe professor of metaphysics, I forget his exact title, at Oxford University, um, uh, and was you know, a very influential, respected figure. Um, earlier wrote Language, Truth and Logic, a statement of sort of logical positivist manif manifesto in the 1920s. Um, and uh, this uh, is an, a quotation from an essay that he wrote in 1949 uh, that he then reprinted in his philosophical essays in the 1950s and it was still widely read um, when I was an undergraduate in the 60s and further on. So in this essay, uh, Air refines the view of what it is to make a moral judgment that he'd put forward in language, truth, and logic, which is sometimes described as the, the uh, uh, boo-hooray theory. So the theory that to say something is morally wrong is basically to say boo to that, um, and to say something is morally right or good is to say hooray to that, um, and uh, was pretty you know, 
unsophisticated sort of theory. Uh, later, Air developed a somewhat more sophisticated version of it. So did other philosophers like uh, Charles Lewis Stevenson. Um, and he puts it forward in this. Um, but then he sharply distinguishes what he's doing, the analysis of moral judgments, as the title of the essay suggests, with um, essentially what we've been doing um, and rejects that. And, and he says, as you can see in this quote, um, that uh, many people find moral philosophy an unsatisfi unsatisfying subject. He acknowledges that people have no doubt said, oh, moral philosophy is not what we thought it would be, maybe students when doing it. But the reason for that is that they make a mistake, according to Ayer. They're mistakenly looking to the moral philosopher for guidance. And you shouldn't do that because that's not part of philosophy. Part of philosophy is just to analyse the meanings of what it is we're doing when we're making moral judgments. Uh, so that was Ayer's view. And I think you know, that's sort of understandable in view of the view of moral judgments that he's holding. Um, but another somewhat more interesting case, in a way, is C.D. Broad, uh, another British philosopher, who wrote a really, what I think is still a really pretty good book, Five Types of Ethical Theory, looking at a variety of different theories, Kantian theory, uh, utilitarian theory, looks at, uh, at Sidgwick in particular. Um, and uh, yet in that book, he also makes this kind of statement that... Um, as he said, we can't learn to act rightly by appealing to the, direct theory, to the ethical theory of right action, no more than we can play golf well by appealing to the mathematical theory of the flight of the golf ball, which, if you think about that, is completely useless. You could have a perfect understanding of the mathematical theory of the flight of a golf ball and no understanding you could be the worst golf player in the world. So it's a pretty sharp sort of contrast. Um, and uh, interest in ethics is that's almost wholly theoretical, he says, almost. Now, it's actually... More surprising that Broad should think this than that Ayer could, because um, Broad himself was homosexual, and uh, he actually signed a letter to the New York Times with some other people in 1958, um, saying that he thought the laws on uh, the homosexual, uh, homosexual acts were then criminal, homosexual acts between males anyway, sodomy was then uh, a crime, and the letter was asking for that law to be repealed. So it's rather strange that... Um, he thinks that there's no, nothing, nothing that a philosopher could say that's relevant to that. Um, and you might think that, well, that's because he's, you know, that was a long time had passed since 1930 when, when this quote. Um, but he hadn't changed his mind. And the other issue on which uh, we know that from is that he was asked by a philosopher called Eugene Freeman to contribute to a book that was going to be a discussion of um, nuclear weapons. This was in 1964, so quite late when this view was perhaps already starting to be uh, challenged. Um, uh, to contribute to a, a, um, a book about uh, uh, nuclear weapons and um, you know, what should be done about nuclear weapons. And he refused, um, saying, I have nothing to say on that issue. And saying, then adding something like, uh, and it's not just me, I think in general philosophy has nothing to say on that issue. So if you think about you know, that as an issue, uh, it's a pretty dramatic view that philosophy would have nothing to say on one of the great questions of our time that threatened the whole destruction of, of uh, the world. Uh, so, um, now, you might think, oh, well, nuclear weapons, 1950s, 1960s, there was at least one philosopher who was applying philosophy to those issues, and that was Bertrand Russell. If you know anything about the campaign for nuclear disarmament in the 50s was led by Russell, got a lot of attention. Um, but in fact, even Russell is not really a counterexample to this view that was prevalent, because Russell didn't think that the work he was doing on nuclear weapons or the other books that he was writing on popular issues about sexual morality, for example, were him writing as a philosopher. He made this distinction between his philosophy um, and his persuasion, or as he even refers to it in this quote, his preaching. Um, the purpose of those books was a kind of preaching. Um, and that's not philosophy, he thought. So again, there's the idea that, you know, either you're just expressing your emotions or you're preaching, you're not really doing philosophy. And that seems to suggest that there isn't much of a role for reason and argument in ethics. And I think that's the real 
um, mistake that's going on here. And I think the rise of applied ethics has been really important, um, not only in the results that it's led to, which I'm going to talk about, but also in showing that there is a role for reason and argument, that um, we can do this, that, that when we, for example, if we're teaching applied ethics, as I'm sure many people in this room are, um, we don't just uh, give our students good grades if, if we say hooray for the views they express uh, and give them bad grades if we say boo to those views if we don't like them, that we actually can evaluate them on the basis of the quality of argument. And even when people argue for views that I don't hold at all, that, that are opposed to my views, I can still see that they're writing, they're good students and they should get good, good marks because they're reasoning uh, very well in that. And the same, of course, is true now. We, we know when we submit uh, articles in applied ethics to peer-reviewed journals um, that uh, we get peers to review them, that peers give comments on the, the quality and cogency of the argument um, and not just on whether they agree or disagree with the conclusion. So that seems totally obvious now. But it's interesting that you know, these philosophers not that long ago didn't find it obvious at all. So this is Hegel's work, I guess, represented as the, the wings of the owl. But at least in the issue of um, the treatment of animals, I think this was clearly wrong. Um, and this is not uh, you know, just my own impression, which you might well think is, is biased, um, but uh, comes from this book, um, written by two sociologists, looking at um, uh, the animal rights movement. Uh, there's various things about this book I don't like. I don't like the use of the term crusade, um, because I don't think the crusades were a good thing. Um, and I do think the animal rights movement was a good thing. Um, uh, but it, um, it does, you know, mostly reasonably accurately describe uh, how the animal uh, rights movement uh, developed and, and how it went on. Um, and, as I say, it uh, clearly suggests that philosophers played an important role in the birth and rise of that animal movement. And I do think that that's correct. So I happen to have um, an old photo of some of the midwives of the animal uh, movement that I thought might amuse you. Um, and here we are, none of us female, however, although there were certainly philosophers writing about it. But this just was taken. At th to my knowledge, this was the first uh, philosophy conference on uh, ethics and animals held in Blacksburg, Virginia. Uh, the Virginia S State University and Polytech uh, in 1979. I looked at the, um, there was, this has been published as a volume by, uh, on ethics and animals edited by Harlan Miller and William Williams. I looked at the contents and there were two women present, I'm glad to say, Annette Beyer and Deborah Mayo, but um, they somehow didn't make it into this photo at the time. So, um, uh, unfortunately, Stephen Clark and I are the only ones in this group still around, which is really sad. Um, Tom Regan died a couple of years ago. Jim Rachels died quite a few years before that. Um, and Henry Spira died in 1978. Uh, Henry Spira is the one here who is not actually a philosopher, but was, uh, I think, probably the most effective animal activist, certainly in the United States, uh, if not anywhere in the world, in the last uh, quarter of the 20th century. <coughs> Okay, so to me the key notion that I wanted to get out in my own work was the idea of, of speciesism. Um, so I'm not going to go into the philosophy of, of animal ethics in too much detail here, but just briefly, uh, what I argued, uh, and I should say by the way, let me give credit to uh, Richard Ryder, um, who is the person who, as far as I know, uh, coined this term. Um, I didn't coin it. Uh, I was in Oxford, he was in Oxford at the time. Uh, there was a small number of people concerned about the way animals were being treated that I came to meet and uh, he, um, he, he, put, he published a leaflet uh, against uh, experiments on animals which had a photo of a very sick looking chimpanzee who'd been infected with syphilis in order to try to see whether you could find something about, chimp, you know, about syphilis and how to treat it from chimpanzees. Um, and it had the heading, it had this one word, speciesism, across the top. And that immediately resonated with me because it makes the analogy with other isms that we know about and reject, particularly racism, sexism. Uh, so, uh, 
I use this in animal liberation. I try to say exactly more precisely what I think it is. Um, and uh, I think that helped to get the term into the language. Uh, and uh, within a few years, it was in the Oxford English Dictionary, which I remember Richard uh, was very pleased about. Um, so uh, I see this as lying behind a lot of our treatment of animals, that we couldn't treat animals in the way we do if it wasn't that we just have very different attitudes to members of our own species than we do to members of, of other species. And I think that this is wrong. Um, and speciesism is reflected in the idea that we then don't give their interests uh, very serious consideration, especially not when they clash with our own interests. Um, so this is what I think we should be doing instead of it. We should adopt a principle of equal consideration of interests which would mean giving similar weight or equal weight to similar interests, irrespective of the species of the being whose interests they are. Um, now, it's really important to get this idea of, of similar interests. Uh, it, this doesn't claim that the interests of humans and non-humans are similar. It's obviously that they're not. You all had an interest in hearing me speak uh, about applied ethics, uh, or you wouldn't be here. Um, no animal has an interest in hearing me speak about applied ethics because they can't understand the concepts that I'm using, at least no animal that we're aware of. So uh, we have different interests, and I'm not saying that all of these interests are equally important. Um, this principle doesn't even commit you to the idea that uh, it's just as bad to kill a non-human animal as it is to kill uh, a typical human being, because it may be the typical human beings because of their Cognitive abilities have interests in continuing to live that are different from or weightier than um, the interests of non-human animals in continuing to live. That's at least possible. I'll just come back to that a little bit later. Um, but it does say that it can't be just on the basis of species. So if you want to say that most humans have an interest in, in continuing to live that no non-human animals don't, and therefore it's worse to kill a typical human than to kill a, a non-human animal. Um, it has to be on something other than the human is a member of the species Homo sapien. As I said, it could be on the basis of the, the cognitive abilities. But then you have this issue that not all humans have cognitive abilities that are superior to those of at least some non-human animals. So it's not something that gives you a complete separation parallel to the boundaries of our species that separates all members of our species from all members of of other species. And that makes things a little more tricky and I think gives pause to those who think it's easy to justify uh, a lot of the practices that we have with regard to non-human animals. Okay, I want to take a little bit to say um, what has the animal movement achieved? Um, and you know, overall my title for this was basically about what difference does uh, applied ethics make and I'm now looking at applied ethics as treated to animals. But of course, you can't, you can't say that applied ethics with regard to animals or philosophy with regard to animal ethics gets all the credit for what's happened to animals, say, since the rise of the animal movement, if you like, say, since 1975 when Animal Liberation was first published. Clearly, there's a lot of other factors coming into this. Um, and even if, as Jasper and Nell can say, philosophers were the midwives of the movement, um, there were people all along who were, you know, long before animal liberation, who were concerned about animals, trying to get change, um, and they clearly played a role in building up organisations that were there, that when more people came into the movement because of applied ethics, um, they were able to go into, in some cases anyway, go into existing organisations, some of them started new organisations. Um, but I do think it's true that the, the movement changed because of uh, philosophers and applied ethics getting into it. The, the image of the animal movement uh, up to that point, up to the 1970s, had um, been one, essentially, you would have to say, of, of, that was not very taken very seriously or not respected by people who were generally activists about important causes. Um, and thinking about myself up to this period, I have to say that I... Uh, until I first was made to think seriously about animals by a chance encounter with 
uh, a fellow graduate student at Oxford, a Canadian called Richard Cashin, um, until, you know, that gave me pause and got me started to thinking about animals. Um, I myself would have had this attitude. So, for instance, I'd been an activist in, uh, against the Vietnam War as a student in Australia. Australia was fighting uh, alongside America in Vietnam. Um, I thought that was wrong. I was very concerned about that. If someone had said to me at that time, no, you should be concerned about the suffering of animals, um, I probably would have said, come on, you know, this animals, these are human beings getting killed here in Vietnam and terrible things that we're doing to them. Um, that's obviously much more important. Um, so there was that attitude that the animal, uh, in fact, the, the phrase was around uh, the animal uh, movement is a movement for old ladies in tennis shoes, which is pretty disrespectful to elderly, to women of a certain age. Um, <laughs> Not to mention, you know, what's wrong with wearing tennis shoes, which I... Um, but uh, uh, it was thought of that way. It was something that, you know, wasn't part of the serious area of, of politics. Um, and it changed. It changed because people started to see this. No, you know, you didn't have to love animals to think that what we were doing with them is wrong. Uh, it wasn't just based on sentiment. There was, a, there was something morally wrong. There was an ethical issue about what we were doing to animals, just as, of course, there was an ethical issue about the war in Vietnam, just as there was an ethical issue about the segregation in the American South or the treatment of uh, indigenous Australians in Australia at the time. So this also was an ethical issue. Um, and that built up the movement, and the movement, I think, has had some successes, even though the successes are very partial. Um, but I just want to, you know, so that we don't forget them, and especially as we are here in the European Union where some of these things that I'm going to show uh, have been achieved, not everywhere in the world, but in some other places as well. So, so these are uh, individual stalls for veal calves. Um, the stalls are about the size of the calf, just slightly larger. Um, they're too narrow for the calf to turn around. They're not long enough for the calf to walk more than half a step, shuffle forward or backwards. Um, and the calves are st taken from their mothers uh, when a day or two old and they're there for the rest of their lives, which is about, was about 14 weeks for the standard veal calves. So it was a really completely miserable uh, existence for them, uh, and that no longer exists in the European Union, uh, no longer exists in several states of the United States, including California, um, by randomizing students in large uh, undergraduate philosophy classes into two groups, uh, which go through a, a number of topics in applied ethics. Uh, and one group gets a topic about animals and the other group gets a topic about giving to charity. Um, that's the control group. We're not able to assess what they give to charity as a result of a week on that. But um, because we're in a situation where they're eating at a student cafeteria and they're using their ID cards um, and their ID cards record what they eat, um, we are able to get information, anonymized information, I should say, but related to students in which wing of the class they are, as to what, what dishes they're ordering at the student cafeteria. So it's really a pretty rigorous study, I think, and this was all Eric's idea, I should say, of doing it this way, so he gets all the, the credit for it. Um, but the indications are that it shows a statistically significant difference. If you get a big enough sample, it's not, it's not super dramatic, it's not like half the students become vegetarian, but it does show that, and it may be, Eric claims, it's the first rigorous study to show a really practical impact of teaching uh, applied ethics to, to a group. So um, it's in preparation. I don't know when it'll come out, um, but sometime, I hope, certainly within the next uh, year or so, it'll be there. Okay, now, uh, what has not been achieved? Well, we haven't made much difference to this, which is chickens being raised for meat. Um, and this is, unfortunately, the largest number of animals um, in the, in, uh, worldwide uh, being raised for food and in particular being in factory farms. Um, estimates something like 50, mi sorry, 50 billion chickens are raised and slaughtered a year worldwide, um, almost all of them in factory farm systems like this. Um, this is a quote from John Webster, who's not a philosopher or an animal activist. He's a professor of veterinary science. I think he's now an emeritus professor of veterinary science who founded the Bristol University's Centre for Animal Welfare, a very big scientific centre for studying animal welfare. Um, and I think he says this not just because it's so many animals that go through it, 
but because his studies show that um, because of the very rapid growth of chicken, so the, today's meat chicken uh, is slaughtered at about 42 days of age, about six weeks of age, very young. That's the result of selective breeding. To get them that big, if you think of the size of a carcass of a supermarket chicken, to get them that big in six weeks is a lot of breeding for rapid growth, for eating a lot and putting on weight really, really fast. The problem is that the leg bones of these birds are immature and um, they have difficulty in standing up on these immature leg bones. And uh, Webster says that for the last two weeks in particular, when they're at their heaviest, uh, they're in pain. They're in pain in the sense that somebody who's got arthritis and is forced to stand up all day would be in pain. Uh, you might say, well, why do they stand up then? Why don't they sit down? Um, they're on uh, litter, as this is known, which might consist of uh, sawdust or wood shavings or maybe straw or something like that, which has probably not been cleaned out for a year. So the birds only last six weeks. They take the birds out. But the litter that they're on might get cleaned out once a year. Um, now, think of all the bird droppings that have gone into that litter. And you can smell it if you ever walk into these places, of course. Um, and, but it's not just that you smell it. You feel the ammonia uh, in your eyes and in your nose and throat if you breathe in in this environment. Um, but the ammonia is also in the litter from all of these droppings. And when it, when it has, gets moisture in it, it forms an acid. Um, so uh, if the birds sit down for too long, they actually get acid burns on their, on their hocks. So that's why they, they generally don't sit. The other thing that can happen here, incidentally, um, is that the legs may actually collapse under them, and then um, they can't move at all. Uh, these lines that you see are what brings food and water to them. Um, and if they, their legs collapse when they're not near somewhere where they can get water, they will just die of thirst. They'll dehydrate. No one is going to walk through and pick up birds that are squatting and you mainly kill them or anything like that. It, it simply doesn't pay. They're just not worth enough to pay the labour. OK, so that's still there. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't had any really big impact on that. Although some of the groups are now working on this to persuade people, try to persuade supermarkets, for example, to stock slower growing breeds that won't have this particular problem. But um, I don't think we've had a huge amount of success yet with that. OK, this is another area where nothing much has changed, and it's been a little slow to do it. Uh, the fishing, now it's, it's true that wild caught fish, at least we don't interfere with their lives. They're not suffering all the way through it uh, as factory farmed animals are. But they don't have humane slaughter either. This is, you know, they, they're caught in vast numbers. We're talking, I, I said maybe 50 billion chickens, but uh, estimates of the number of fish caught uh, is, go over a trillion, so over a thousand <coughs> billion. Um, and you can see the, the vast numbers from this huge net that's being dragged behind by a trawler. Each of these is an individual sentient being. Uh, on top of this net, you can see lots who've been sort of squeezed through the net by the pressure of all of the fish as the net gets pulled up and starts to compress a little bit. Um, they're all individuals. And oh, sorry, I thought I had another slide there of an individual one. Um, OK, so uh, you know, I think there's an immense amount of suffering going on in the, in the dying of these fish, even if not in their living. And that's an issue also that the animal movement hasn't really um, made any progress on. OK. Uh, going back to some of the philosophical questions, as we've got a lot of philosophers in, in the room, I know, and people interested in doing research. So um, my view is that the, the objection to speciesism that I mentioned before is pretty widely accepted among people who've studied this seriously. Not by everybody. Uh, Bernard Williams wrote an article called The Human Prejudice, um, sort of defending speciesism. Uh, Shelley Kagan recently has come out with something on that. Um, so there are still people to be responded to and argued against, I think. But I think a lot of philosophers anyway accept this. But there are other issues that um, are still there and are starting to be discussed a bit more that haven't had a lot of discussion. Um, for me, the boundary of the principle of equal consideration of interests is the boundary of consciousness. If a being is not conscious, it can't feel pain, there's nothing that it's like to be that being, then uh, the being doesn't have interest and equal consideration of interest doesn't apply. So I think we can be highly confident that vertebrate animals are conscious. Some invertebrates are. I think uh, an octopus is clearly a conscious being from observing its behavior. But what about insects? 
Complex behavior, yes. Relatively few ne neurons, though. Um, uh, could the complex behavior just be sort of robotic in a way, uh, automatic, programmed in through evolution, or is there consciousness? Um, hard to know. Hard to know how to make progress on that, but it's a really important question all the same. Uh, wild animal suffering. Uh, I think you had a talk about that from Katya, wherever she is. Thank you, up the back. Um, earlier on, and I'm sorry that I couldn't be there. Um, but that's uh, an, an important issue too that is only just starting to be discussed. Um, uh, should we try to reduce the suffering of wild animals? Um, would that be acting against values that exist in leaving nature alone, in changing nature, that we want to, you know, a lot of people think that we ought to protect wilderness and basically keep humans out of it, so then we wouldn't be able to reduce wild animal suffering, at least in those areas. Um, should we in some others? What are the sort of borderline cases that are not really wilderness, where we're anyway managing animals? Uh, there's a whole set of really interesting ethical questions there that uh, I've started to get some discussion because of some of the people in this room, but um, uh, could certainly use some more. Uh, so the research issue has had more discussion, um, but it's one that I still find quite difficult. Maybe that's because I'm a utilitarian, and some of you will say, well, that's my problem. I should adopt a rights view, and then I wouldn't have these problems. I would just think that uh, doing harmful research on animals is a, a violation of their rights, and that's always wrong no matter what the benefits that come from it. Uh, that was Tom Regan's view, for example, who I showed you in that earlier photo. Um, but I do find it hard to say that, uh, you know, if you could do research on a, a handful of animals that was going to cure a major disease that was killing thousands or hundreds of thousands of humans, that that wouldn't be justified, assuming that that was the only way to cure it. Now, I know this is hypothetical, and people are going to say, well, you could never... You could never do that. You could never know that such an experiment was going to do that. Uh, a lot of experiments on animals are quite misleading in terms of their results for humans. That's also true. Um, but there might be some candidates uh, where there's a plausible case to be made that animal research uh, has had or could have very big benefits and, and you couldn't get those benefits otherwise. Um, so there's, there's still questions there. And then people say, well, even if you admit that, you know, what, what about basic research that advances science that often does lead to very beneficial spin-offs, but we don't really know in advance whether it's going to do so. So that's uh, another issue. And then something that's been discussed a little bit, uh, there was an article by Adam Shriver about this, and I think maybe one or two others. Um, some scientists have suggested that we could knock out pain receptors in mice, say, um, so that they would not be capable of suffering pain. So this is talking about physical pain. And then there might be some research that you could justify on them, which you would not justify if they were feeling pain. Now, of course, physical pain is not the only problem with animal research. Uh, there's often problems about how they're kept in captivity, what their lives are like. Um, but would it be worth doing if, if this research is going on anyway on animals capable of feeling pain, would it be worth doing, or would this somehow, if you like, be the ultimate reduction of animals to uh, means to our ends, if um, you're sort of Kantian or influenced by that approach and think that that's wrong? So that's uh, another issue that's around and worth discussing. Let's move to the second area that I wanted to talk about, effective altruism, where I think philosophy has also played a very significant role. So what is effective altruism? If there's anybody here not familiar with this uh, concept, um, it's now got a Wikipedia page. Um, it wouldn't have had 10 years ago because the term was only coined, maybe even slightly less than 10 years ago, uh, by a group of people, uh, many of them philosophers uh, in Oxford. Uh, so it's a philosophy and social movement which applies evidence and reason to determining the most effective way to benefit others. So. Altruism is the idea that we want to benefit others, that that should be at least one, uh, one important goal in our life, not that that's the only thing that we do, but it's one important part of our life. And uh, in doing that, we want to use the resources we put into it as effectively as we can. So we, you know, if we're donating money, we want to get 
the best value for the money in terms of um, in terms of benefiting others. And if we're putting in time, then the same thing goes for that. So, as I say, philosophers played a, a key role in this. Um, ah, sorry, before I get into that, um, there are some philosophical questions relating to the values of effective altruists. Um, now, I, I describe these as characteristic effective altruist values because um, it's not a church or anything like that that has, you know, a creed that you have to sign up to. It's not a political party. Um, it's a loose movement that has a variety of different organizations that regard themselves as part of it. Um, so this is not necessarily true of everybody, but typically effective altruists uh, regard themselves as cosmopolitans or global humanitarians. That is, they're not just seeking to do good for their own community or their own country, but for the world as a whole. Um, Secondly, if you ask, well, what is doing good? I think all of them would agree that reducing suffering and preventing premature death, at least preventing premature death for normal humans, I suppose they might say, um, uh, um, the, the, that, is, um, that that benefits those whose suffering is reduced or whose deaths are prevented. So those are some good things. They're, this is not supposed to be an exhaustive list. Many effective altruists would add other things but I think that's a common core that effective altruists would agree on. And thirdly, they agree that animal suffering matters. I haven't met an effective altruist who just thinks that it's not important at all. But some of them think that human suffering matters more and we should give priority to trying to reduce human suffering. Some of them think that if we can reduce suffering more by focusing on animals, then we should focus on animals. So the movement is open to both of those, you know, both of those things. All right, I was going to tell you about some of the philosophers that have been involved. Uh, here's Toby Ord, who was a graduate student at Oxford, um, when he started thinking about how much good he could do. Um, he had read uh, uh, Famine, Affluence and Morality, the article I wrote in the uh, early 1970s, um, which got anthologized in a lot of uh, anthologies used for teaching, so quite a lot of undergraduates do read it. But... Um, it's interesting that although that article was written in the 70s, the effective altruism movement didn't take off until about 10 years ago. Um, so although the movement was widely taught, I think uh, for one reason or another, people were not responding to it in the sense of saying, yes, this is something that I should do. This should change how I live. Uh, I mean, some people did. I know also there were people there who told me that they'd change it their giving practices because of reading Famine, Affluence and Morality, but relatively few. Um, and I think uh, to some extent people were just seeing it as a sort of a, an article that raised a logical problem. That is, you know, starts with a plausible premise that you would save a drowning child from a pond if you could do so at no risk to yourself and just the modest cost of ruining your expensive shoes that you were wearing. Um, and then suggesting that there's some kind of parallel between that and helping children in extreme poverty who are dying, let's say, from preventable diseases, um, and that if it's wrong not to save the child in the pond, then why isn't it wrong to not save the child dying from malaria when you could donate to an organisation that would distribute bed nets so that fewer children got malaria? Um, so as I say, I think people, a lot of people sort of thought, of, well, this is puzzling, I'm not quite sure why, but it leads to a very demanding conclusion, so somehow it must be wrong. But uh, Toby's one of those who decided that, yeah, you know, probably that's not wrong. Probably we ought to be doing more of this. Um, and he started, he asked himself the question, so how much good could one person do if they really took this seriously? How much good could I do, for example? Now, Toby was a graduate student living on a scholarship in Oxford, and doing very well, so he was reasonably confident that he'd have a career as an academic philosopher. And in fact, as you see, that's how things are working out for him at the moment. Um, so if you're going to have a career as an academic philosopher, especially in Britain, perhaps more so than in the US, where salaries might vary more, but in Britain, you can pretty much predict how much you're going to earn over your lifetime. You know, when you're at this age, you'll probably be on a salary like this. When you're at that age, you'll be on a bit more, so on, then you'll retire when you're... 68 or whatever the retirement age is. 
So Toby worked all of that out, how much he would earn. Then he worked out how much he could live on, which was just a, a bit more than, than his graduate scholarship, he thought. You know, my graduate scholarship, I, he, he was actually living on, he wasn't starving, but he allowed himself a little bit more, but not very much more. And said, that'd be fine, you know, then I can still have a bit of money for vacations and things of that sort. So then he multiplied that by the number of years up to his retirement, uh, deducted it from the sum total that he was going to earn up to his retirement, and then looked around for good cost-effective things that he could do with that. And he came up with preventing blindness by treating kids with trachoma. Trachoma is the most common cause of preventable blindness in the world. Uh, it's a bacteria that gets in the eyes of people in countries where it's hot and dusty and hygiene is not very good. Um, so, uh, but it's very easy and very inexpensive to treat. Um, you treat. You treat all the kids who get this in various ways. So he came across an article that said you could prevent a case of blindness for only $25 uh, in, through trachoma. And when he uh, divided the sum of money that he was going to have spare in his career by $25, the answer was 80,000. So 80,000 cases of blindness that he calculated he would be able to prevent just by living fairly modestly um, on an academic salary and donating the rest. Um, so, uh, and he was pretty stunned by that. Um, and I think it is a pretty stunning answer, you know. Because most people who said, hey, uh, you know, what did you do through your life? Well, I present, prevented somebody becoming blind. That's great. People think, yeah, you've, you've lived to some purpose there. That's really good. Suppose you've prevented a whole football stadium full of people becoming blind. That's even more amazing. So to uh, Toby thought people ought to know about that, and he started this organization called Giving What We Can to tell people about that and to ask them to pledge not to give as much as he was going to planning to give, but to give at least 10% of their income to effective charities. Uh, and he's done that, um, and he's got thousands of people to pledge, and if they carry through with their pledges, and probably not all of them will, but hopefully quite a lot will, um, that is going to be, I can't remember the, the exact figure, but I, it was, um, uh, I think it was in the hundreds of billions of dollars that those people would be donating um, through, through what they've earned. So it was pretty substantial. And already the amount that's been donated is, um, uh, you know, many tens of millions. So this, this is another example of a, a, a movement started by philosophers making a significant difference. Um, I want to give credit to another philosopher who was also a graduate student at the same time, um, a friend of Toby's, uh, 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 Will McCaskill, um, who is also now, um, I think, think associate professor is his correct title, um, at Oxford. Um, worked with Toby to establish Giving What We Can, then founded uh, an organization called 80,000 Hours, which gives advice on ethical careers. Um, if you know people who are at a career choice stage, um, have a look at that. It gives you a lot of interesting information about how you can make a difference in the world through a variety of different careers. And he co-founded the Center for Effective Altruism in Oxford, which is another organization promoting effective altruism. Uh, so he's also, I think, made a pretty substantial difference. I met him in Oxford uh, on this trip to Europe just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and he had just come back from speaking to uh, a meeting of um, people who've taken the Giving Pledge. The Giving Pledge, I think, was partly inspired by Giving What We Can's pledge, um, uh, and perhaps partly by what I put in uh, The Life You Can Save in that book. Um, uh, it was started by Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett, and they pledged to give at least half of their wealth to uh, charity before they died. In fact, uh, uh, They've already given more than that, and Buffett has said that he'll give 99% of his wealth. Um, but they've got other people to pledge too. Um, and uh, there's now over 200 billionaires who've pledged, and uh, uh, Will said he'd just been speaking to about 150 of them who were in the room. Um, and I, again, I, I, I haven't kept this number in my head, but he said there was um, something like, I think he said, the, the people in the room controlled something like uh, 300 billion or maybe it was even more than that. Um, so a lot of money, half of which was going to go to charity, and Will's purpose in being there was to try to persuade them to find the most effective charities, because the Giving Pledge is non-specific in terms of what you give to. Uh, so 
uh, it's another example of, I think, why you know, philosophy, applied ethics, effective altruism is really making a very significant difference in terms of moving large amounts of money to uh, effective charities, as well as getting people to think about effectiveness and getting people to do more research into which are the most effective charities. Now, what are the ethical issues here that need discussion? Well, an important one is where the money goes. This is the website of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, uh, a very big uh, advising service, started advising the Rockefeller brothers, um, and then uh, more general. So for wealthy philanthropists who want to give their money away, um, you can go on their website and have a look, and it says here, you can read this line, giving away money is simple, giving away money effectively is an entirely different matter. Absolutely true. But what do they then say about how to give money effectively? Well, you can find this statement on their website. What's the most urgent issue? There's obviously no objective answer to that question. How does this compare objectively with this, which is what I was talking about before? These are kids in North Africa uh, getting treated for trachoma. So for $500 million, OK, let's say it's not $25 anymore, you know, um, but even if it's $100, um, so you know, we're talking about 5 million kids that you could prevent going blind for, for, 500, uh, for $500 million. Is it worth having a renovated concert hall? Is that better than preventing um, 5 million cases of blindness? I don't think so, um, but, you know, I, can we find a method of showing that that's objectively so? And here's another example, by the way, um, that raises this. This is the fire in Notre Dame not so long ago. You might have noticed that within about 24 hours of the fire, a um, hundred billion euros, no, sorry, a billion euros had been pledged uh, to renovate and restore Notre Dame. Um, and uh, some people said, hey, wait a minute, France has a lot of problems. It just had the Yellow Vest movement. Um, uh, so, you know, wouldn't it be better, if all this money has suddenly come out for this, why wasn't this money coming out for people in need? Um, and I would say not only in France, but also in much poorer countries. Um, but that's, you know, so that's something you can think about yourself. Is there an objective answer to whether it's better to spend the money on restoring Notre Dame or on uh, helping people in extreme poverty? Um, that one, I think, is a little harder than the uh, renovation of uh, the concert hall in the Lincoln Center because it is, if you like, a cultural heritage. But um, I still think there's a pretty good case for saying that renovating Notre Dame was not the best use of the money. Okay, I'm getting near the end. Um, thanks for your patience. So another ethical question is, how do you compare the suffering of animals and humans, um, both suffering and death? I've already talked a little bit about questions about the wrongness of killing animals. Uh, this is an organization that tries to find the most effective animal charities. Um, okay. Uh, tries to find the most effective animal charities. Um, but to do that, really, to do that properly, you would need to compare the suffering of different species of animals, right? Because uh, let's say you're, 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 you might donate to an animal charity that has been reasonably successful in persuading some supermarket chains or fast food brands to not stock um, certain animal products. So let's say to not stock eggs from caged hens or not stock pig products from sows kept in those stalls that I showed you. Um, okay, if you do that and you add up just numbers, it would be better to focus on trying to get them not to stock the eggs from caged hens because uh, there'd be a lot more hens affected than, uh, than sows. Um, but is the suffering of a hen in a cage similar to the suffering of a sow in, um, in those stalls? Uh, Pretty hard to compare. Um, you know, you might say pigs, more intelligent animals, do they have a greater capacity for, su for suffering in some way? Uh, not at all easy to say. Um, but ideally, if you really wanted to know what was the most effective way of reducing suffering, you would have to try to have some methods of comparing animal suffering, different species. And if you then, as an effective altruist, wanted to answer that question I mentioned earlier, should we try to work on reducing animal suffering or should we try to work on reducing human suffering, um, you would want to be able to compare human suffering 
and animal suffering as well. So that's not something that we're really able to do at present. Are there any ways in which we might be able to do it? Do we need advances in neuroscience? Anything else? I think it's, a, it's perhaps an area where philosophers and scientists of various sorts need to come together. And then here's this question of um, uh, existential risk that effective altruists talk about. Um, existential risk is the risk of the extinction of our species, as this slide suggests, which could happen in a variety of ways. Uh, this one is easier to depict than some of the others. Uh, you can imagine a large asteroid uh, or comet colliding with our planet, so large that it would cause the extinction of, of uh, our species or of life on Earth in general. Um, it's a very small risk, you might say. It hasn't happened, you know, a really big asteroid hasn't happened for a very long time. I think 65 million years is the one that many scientists believe wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, hasn't been anything that big since then, but it could happen. So what could we do about it? Well, we could track large bodies on orbits or that close to ours, and in fact NASA is already doing that. Um, and then if we do find something, we could develop rocket science so that we could build a rocket that maybe we could fire to intercept it, uh, have an explosive uh, that would deflect it slightly from its course, and maybe prevent extinction. So that's a fairly practical way of doing it. You could roughly cost what that might cost and then think about how the odds against that and decide whether that's uh, worth doing. Um, there are various other scenarios of which one that effective altruists have become interested in is the scenario of uh, artificial intelligence um, becoming smarter than we are and able to eliminate us and not having values that would prevent them eliminating us. Um, so you've had a lot of discussion about uh, artificial intelligence, I know, uh, at this conference. That's one of the issues. And that raises some, the, this whole question of existential risk raises pretty difficult philosophical questions because you need to ask yourself, um, so if it's quite expensive to prevent this risk, and if, if the risk is very small, then should we put money into trying to guard against that risk rather than deal with the other problems which are here and now and which we already know how to, how to prevent, like preventing blindness or preventing kids getting malaria or some of those things. So in order to decide that, you have to decide how bad is the extinction of our species. Well, one thing that you might say is if it were to happen now, that would mean the death of 7.6 billion people premature deaths of those billion people, many of whom would still be young and otherwise would have long lives to lead. So that's one bad thing about it. But the philosophers who are most concerned about extinction risk and who do think that this is a good thing to put money into, even though the risks are small and even though there are other good things we could do here and now, um, they're influenced by the idea that it won't just mean the deaths of 7.6 billion people, it will mean the non-births of a vastly larger number of people in future. In other words, assume that we don't become extinct in the next century or two, and after that we've got better technologies for preventing extinction, and we've colonized other planets, so even if an asteroid collides with this planet, our species won't become extinct, and we'll eventually be able to replenish the earth and so on. Um, so that could go on, you know, the, the, our species could survive for billions of years, perhaps, who knows. And then you would have this incredible number of uh, lives that are being lived. Assume, if you're optimistic enough, that these lives will be good lives, that we'll have solved all the problems that face us now, that everybody will have enough to meet their basic needs and will enjoy various uh, cultural riches that we can't even imagine, various pleasures that we can't even imagine. So um, if you think of that going on for billions of years with uh, who knows how many uh, billions or trillions or quintillions of, of human beings, and all of that gets prevented by this extinction event, whatever it might be, then it starts to look like really good value to invest in that extinct, preventing extinction risk. But 
Some people think that um, the lives of beings who will never exist don't really count in the scales, right? That if, um, if beings are never going to come into existence, well, they haven't been harmed. True, they, they haven't existed, um, but in some people's view, that doesn't matter. Um, it goes back a little bit to the bringing happy animals into existence. In a way, it's the same kind of issue. Um, or some people will say, well, if the animal never exists, that doesn't matter. You're not harming any animal. So therefore, there's no particular compensating good to compensate for killing this existing animal if you don't bring the other one into existence. Um, these are really difficult philosophical issues. Those of you not familiar with it, um, the, uh, the key work is Derek Parfitt's um, particular uh, part four of his book, Reasons and Persons. Um, um, but there's been a lot of other discussion by philosophers uh, spinning off that work uh, from Parfitt. So um, that's a big philosophical question that is still open and is relevant to uh, both effective altruism and some of the questions about animals. Okay, um, but I want to give you one last slide which I think talks about the power of applied ethics pretty strongly. Uh, this is a guy called Chris Croy who I've never met though we've um, emailed. He was taking a class in philosophy uh, a few years ago, not at any high-powered university, at a community college in uh, St. Louis in the US. Um, the class was set my Famine, Affluence and Morality article, and it was set an article critical of that by a philosopher called John Arthur. Um, Arthur argued against uh, my view that we ought to be donating lots of money to help people in extreme poverty, um, that this has this is, has conclusions that are too demanding. And the way in which Arthur tried to show that these conclusions are too demanding is he said, well, why should you just give money, right? There are other things that we could give. For example, we don't really need to have two kidneys. We can do quite well uh, on one kidney. Um, so if Singer's right, why wouldn't we have an obligation to donate a kidney to a stranger? just somebody on the waiting list, because there's long waiting lists for people with kidneys, their quality of life is not very good, they're on dialysis, and in fact, quite a number of them die uh, while they're on the waiting list to get an organ. So donating a kidney does something really good. I was uh, wondering what you thought of an argument, I believe due to Travis Zimmerman, that actually, surprisingly, almost nobody is really a speciesist. So uh, here's how it goes. Um, suppose I learned that all the people in this room it just so happens they happen to have wildly different evolutionary histories from me, right? So their distant ancestors were from Mars or something like that. Um, now, very plausibly, whatever Homo sapiens is, it has a certain evolutionary history. And so I'm going to conclude, if I learn this, that none of the people in this room are human beings. I'm going to conclude that they're really similar to human beings or something like that, but I'm not going to think they're members of, well, I'm not going to think they're members of Homo sapiens, right? But I guess my thought is, even if I'm, you know, I'm not supposed to think less of these people, I'm not supposed to like, care less about them or something like that, I would just regard this as a really surprising result. But it seems like I should like, come to care less about them and so forth if I learned this, if I really was a speciesist, right? So you might take this to show, I don't really care about the species membership of you know, all these people. I care about something else, maybe something like the fact that they're similar to me in certain in certain like morally significant respects, or the fact that they're human beings, where you understand the human not as a biological species, but as something something else, you know, I don't know what that would be, but that's that's a view some people defend. So I'm just wondering what you think of that argument. Yeah, um, obviously, if that situation were to arise, it would be a, a, a huge challenge to our idea that um, species is a moral boundary, um, and. Whether that shows that we are not speciesist or whether it would sort of, you know, rapidly shake us out of our speciesism by realizing this is, is another question. You, um, but the, the, the counter argument here is that um, we do seem to include all members of our species in a certain moral framework um, in having some basic rights. Uh, now, you know, there are questions about exactly now, how we treat people with profound intellectual disabilities, for example. But, um, you know, I don't think anywhere, uh, as far as the law is concerned, I don't think anywhere you're, uh, you're 
allowed to actively kill them, you know, even countries that have uh, active voluntary euthanasia, it has to be voluntary. These people are not capable of it. Um, similarly, we don't use them for uh, research of the kind we use on animals, um, even though they would be better research subjects in that some of the differences between species would not be relevant there. Uh, so it does seem like we're, we're, we're trying to draw certain moral boundaries um, exactly parallel to our species. Um, you know, maybe what's going on is that we actually value beings who have certain qualities and characteristics, rationality, self-awareness, and so on, um, and then we somehow extend a sort of honorary status to those who are members of our species but lack those. Um, and, you know, that still seems to me to be a certain kind of speciesism. Um, so I'm going to stick to the view that speciesism is important, although I agree that maybe the example shows that it's not, it's not just the straightforward kind of speciesism in the way that I'm thinking of. Uh, effective altruists can basically just kind of avoid taking a position on the demandingness of morality. Kind of focus only on kind of arguing for something like a conditional effectiveness. Right? If you're going to give it all, you should give effectively rather than ineffectively. Uh, but just kind of avoid, you know, making the famine affluence and morality style argument for the view that uh, you know people who either don't give it all or give relatively little but have a lot are kind of doing something seriously wrong. Yeah. Um, so clearly, I think that you are doing something wrong if you're comfortably off and you don't do anything to help people in extreme poverty elsewhere in the world. Um, I'm not quite sure, I guess I should talk to them, I'm not quite sure whether people who make the position, take the position that you mention. So Theron uh, Hummer has an argument. I know Theron has, a, has an argument, uh, yeah, I, I thought that was who you were referring to. Yeah, yeah. But, but is, is Theron just doing this as, an, as, an, as a hypothetical argument um, to say, you know, I don't have to make Singer's kind of argument, I, I can make this as another argument and then maybe I'll get a different sort of audience uh, for it? Um, or, or is he really saying, um, and I, d I don't think Singer's argument is, is sound or convincing? Yes, he thinks both that uh, it's, a it's the right philosophical position that in a lot of cases uh, there can be a justification for refusing to give at all and at the same time, conditional on the fact that you're going to give, it's wrong to give less effectively rather than more effectively. Uh, and I think he also thinks, and I think many people think, that it's kind of a good thing for the purpose of effective altruist social movement right. building, yeah. that we can kind of uh, target people who maybe are already disposed to give, uh, but not try and kind of persuade people that, you know, people who don't give but could are doing it. Wrong, so that's kind of awful. Yeah, yeah. So I've heard people say that, and that's what I was kind of wondering. Some people saying, "Look, you know, my, in my experience, the sort of the, the moral demand argument doesn't move many people. Some people, sometimes it makes people hostile. Even you know, you're coming across as being self-righteous. So instead, they focus on the idea that you know, it gives you a great feeling when you give. That sort of motivation, you know, uh, and and there is psychological research that backs that up. And I often refer to that myself. Um, so they might be thinking that it's just more effective, instead of saying you ought to give, to say, um, you know, it's really great giving, you feel terrific when you do it, and when doing it, you really ought to be trying to get the most good from your money that you could. Um, Peter, uh, do you think that uh, the people that say that uh, we shouldn't help animals, uh, we shouldn't help, uh, we should help people instead of animals, are the first one that the, doesn't help anyone. It's correct to say that uh, most people um, uh, are explicit uh, when they like, because we see uh, some image of mouses in research and we don't care, but we see dogs and whoa, that's not okay. Or we see cows and pigs in production, but we see if, if we see a form of puppies, uh, that, uh, that's not cool for us. And uh, what, what's your thoughts about the expression that humans are uh, superior than other species? Right, okay, I'll try and remember. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, 
all three of these things. People who say, yeah, you know, people who say if you're in sort of talking about animals or they know that you're someone helping in the animal movement, who say, I think we should help humans first, you're right, very often they don't do anything for either of them. Um, that's certainly true. But, but there clearly are some effective altruists who are doing a lot for humans and uh, who maybe have thought about that and have decided that human interests uh, outweigh animal interests for various kinds of reasons, including the sorts of differences that they make, right? Um, okay, now, uh, the, second, the second thing you said has already gone out right here. Mouse, we see mouses and we see... Ah, that's right, yeah. So the, 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 I could say, you know, and I don't know whether this is relevant to Michael's question, that in fact there's two kinds of speciesism, really. There's speciesism that uh, is just about humans being superior to other animals. And then there's speciesism about the animals that we like um, and care about, which is more like to be dogs or cats, maybe add in horses, um, and not mice, um, and not rats, and certainly not fish, and probably not chickens either. Um, so that's, uh, that is also a kind of species that obviously relates to us. It's a sort of, you know, one step removed speciesism. It's the kind of animals we like rather than just us. Yes, and there was a third one, if you remind me of that. Now. Uh, so we are superior. Ah, yeah. Well, that, it depends on what you mean, you know. Clearly, as I said, no non-human animal is going to come and listen to this talk. Um, so, yes, we are superior in our cognitive abilities. We, have, we can understand uh, language that employs abstract concepts. Um, and uh, as far as we can see, no non-human animal can do that. Um, but if th this... So, I, I, you know, in that sense, I don't object to it. But I do object to it if it means that we have superior moral status. Um, and particularly, as I say, if it means we have superior moral status just because we're human rather than um, because we're capable of doing various things or of thinking about our life in a different, more long-term way than they can. Um, I don't see any justification for thinking that we have superior moral status in a way that means that uh, the pains of humans matter more than similar quantities of pains for animals. Can you say something about your thoughts about bullfights? Which is an important example for us here in Portugal. <laughs> sure. Look, um, but uh, I'll say something about it, but you, you, you may not really like what I say. Um, I think bull, clearly, I think bullfights are wrong, right? I think they're causing suffering to animals for um, no uh, important reason. Um, and possibly they encourage bad attitudes to animals in that it gives people the idea that it's okay to inflict suffering on an animal for people's entertainment. But having said that, the number of bulls that suffer in the bull ring, as compared to the number of chickens who suffer in the factory farms, is, is totally negligible. Um, and probably even the bull has a better life, because until it gets in the bull ring, the bull is quite well treated. Um, so um, although I would, you know, I'll certainly sign petitions to ban bullfights or you know, whatever people want along those lines. But if those same people are continuing to eat factory farm chickens, I think that they're just completely misguided in what their priorities are. Maybe I make one question? Yeah, you can have a question, of course. Yeah, yeah. So one, of, one of the many ways I was made to go back to your animal liberation was Cora Diamond's, an old paper of hers from the 1970s called Eating Meat and Eating People. And uh, one of her points there was I, she agrees with you in substance, but she doesn't agree with your way of arguing. Because uh, according to her, um, you basically take sentience and existence of interests and you consider, to generally consider every sentient being and being a person. Then she's interested in, um, in pointing out things like this. For instance, it's not as a matter of regard for the interests of another human that you don't eat them. It is not as a matter of regard for the interests of another human that you don't have, let's say, sexual relations with your parents or with your offspring. Her point is that that is constitutive of, of what makes humans human, and it is neither genetic or uh, it's not about interests. So how would you answer that? Because she agrees, let's say, with your vegetarianism, with your concern yeah. for animals, but not with the way of argument. Yeah. Um, before I give you an answer, I'd, I'd, I'd like to explain why there's this sudden revival in Cora Diamond, because this is the second time in two days. I was, you know, was it, uh, no, well, maybe it's a little more to but Monday evening I was lecturing in Paderborn in Germany about animals, and I got uh, a very similar question, and I hadn't, 
you know, I, of course, was interested in Cora Diamond's work and read it in the 70s, but I'd hardly heard anybody mention it in, for a long time. But here it's mostly because of logic and philosophy of language that we are interested in her. It's not so much her I ethics. see. It's not so much her ethics. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so um, I, I, I don't agree with her um, about why it is that we don't eat humans. I mean, I guess there's a variety of reasons why we, we bury humans, but of course, you know, there are some cultures at some times that have eaten humans, and it maybe depends on uh, a variety of different factors. Um, but in general, I guess Cora Diamond's approach comes out of a, a Wittgensteinian background, which really looks at um, the practices we have. You know, Wittgenstein was interested in the practices, the way we use language, um, and it's, it's really sort of describing practices we have. Um, and it's, to me, it's not really normative. It doesn't really say uh, whether these are the right practices to have because it sees, um, it sees morality as growing out of these social practices. Whereas, um, of course, morality you know, does have social practices. It has a, a, a number of different roots and our customs and habits and social practices are one source of morality. Um, and I think... Uh, Evolutionary developments are another source of our morality, and you know we share some of that morality in some form with our close primate relatives. Um, uh, but I also think that there is rationality in morality, and in a way, you know, that's why I started off with uh, Eyre and Broad and, and Russell pointing out that because they had this view that, that there isn't much reasoning in morality. Though as I say, I'm still surprised that Broad had this view, but certainly Eyre and Russell did. Um, they didn't think you could do applied ethics. So I think that reasoning plays a role and I think we um, can have reasons for rejecting social practices and a lot of customs. And I think you know, some of the things that Cora Diamond says make me a bit uncomfortable because I think about similar things that you could say about other practices that we would clearly reject, like uh, practices in which um, men tell women what to do and women obey them. Um, you know, so you could also say, well, that's constitutive of what it is to be a man, right? Um, it doesn't mean unchangeable. Constitutive doesn't mean unchangeable. Okay, but then, then it doesn't answer, if it doesn't mean unchangeable, then it doesn't answer the moral questions of how we ought to treat animals and how we ought to treat humans, and, and indeed whether it would be wrong to decide to eat our dead ancestors, as uh, you know, some, some cultures have done. You can go first, and if there's someone who still wants to, we'll get time for that, I hope. Well, like the question, the first question is that the idea of the sinking beings, if you ask a defensive flyer, I don't think you ask that if you could ever consider that artificial intelligence could fit, because it's quite open wide, you know, yep. definition. And secondly, uh, about the idea of full fledged altruism, if it is could, uh, in a way, can it erase the issue of a political struggle? Because instead of having an idea that you can always change political structure and our idealism, we kind of end up with this type of an idealism inside what we consider as normal. And since we consider this as normal, we just need to have more altruism in this form of society that kind of would fix the problem. And we don't need, for example, this course of political struggle. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so firstly, yes, I do think it's at least in principle possible for an artificial intelligence to be a conscious being. Um, I don't think we're anywhere close to that yet. But, um, you know, I do think that consciousness is, is based in a physical object, uh, our brains, um, and therefore I don't see why you couldn't construct a different physical object that had the same connections and so on and that produced consciousness. Um, the objection that sort of uh, effective altruism somehow is uh, contrast with political movements or doesn't give a place for political movements um, does come up from time to time. Uh, I think that there's no reason why effective altruists shouldn't support political struggles. Um, it's just that they need to have some sort of estimate of what the result of the political struggle will be, that is how much will be gained from the political struggle. Obviously, it has to be better than the present status quo. And, um, and then you also have to consider, and how likely is it that we'll achieve that goal? So in, in, you know, those are the, the questions that effective altruists have to ask in choosing a cause. How much good 
and how likely is it that we'll be able to achieve that good, or, or even more specifically, that my contribution towards that will make it more likely that we'll achieve that good. So um, I think there are some political struggles where, where that's perfectly plausible. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of things, for example, things that I, I one of the organisations that I've supported is uh, Oxfam, a major charity, and not all of their work is just going into villages and helping people to get clean drinking water or something like that. Uh, they have, for example, worked with civil society organisations in Ghana to uh, get some of the revenue that Ghana gets from its fairly newly discovered uh, oil and gas fields flowing to some of the poorest farmers. It's called an oil for agriculture program. Um, so that took political struggle, not in the sense of revolutionary political struggle, because Ghana has a fairly active civil society and is a reasonably democratic society, but certainly it was political struggle to make sure that that oil money didn't just go to people who are already comfortably off. And that was a case where I think there was a reasonable chance of achieving that. The costs of achieving it were not so high. Oxfam was able to bring uh, some money and some expertise to help civil society groups. So, uh, you know, that's a small example. But if people say, as they sometimes do, um, look, I really think the problem is global capitalism, um, and what we need to do is to get rid of global capitalism, then obviously, you know, the first question is, yes, and what are you going to put in its place? Show me a system that's, that's worked well. Um, and secondly, tell me how you're going to put that in the place of the present capitalist system. And if I can't have answers to that, that, you know, have some plausibility, then I'm not going to be, you know, I, 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 I'd rather put my money to saving kids from getting malaria. We have seen that uh, veganism is being played uh, a more important role nowadays. Uh, do you think the politics is playing the main role? Or uh, other, other questions about uh, veganism? Uh, people are more aware of animal rights or there's something else? I'm sure that people are more aware of animal rights and, and of the treatment of animals in factory farms in particular. But it's very hard to say how big a role that is playing as compared with what seem to me the other two main factors. One of them I would also consider an ethical factor because that's climate change. And we heard a very good talk on that this afternoon about how urgent um, and if you saying, I'm not going to eat meat because I know that meat is a major contributor to climate change and plant-based foods will reduce my greenhouse gas uh, footprint, um, then I think that's definitely an, an ethical reason for doing it. And I think that's quite a powerful reason with uh, a number of people. The third reason is health. Um, and perhaps you would say that's not an ethical reason. It's more self-interested. Um, you know, although obviously it's good if people are healthy. It saves money for the health service or whatever. Um, so it's not a bad thing at all. I'm, I'm happy if people are becoming vegan for that reason. Um, so these seem to me to be the three major reasons. Um, and the other thing that I'll just say is I think it's really good that we're getting more and better plant-based foods um, and perhaps eventually we'll get sort of cellular agriculture, cultured meat coming, which is both better for the animals and better for the environment um, because that's going to make it easier for more people to make that shift. And the more we get, the easier it becomes, the more there's a market for it. So... Um, I think it's great that this is becoming a factor along with the ethical arguments. Okay. Uh, don't you think it would be more ethical and reasonable to teach people and the, that these companies only look for profits and they and we shouldn't like uh, give uh, animals a respectful life uh, to turn them into food? I guess it ends up not being respectful at all. They just uh, they get they get deal with uh, as well, so it, that's not respectful at all in my opinion. I would like to know what you think. And the question is how many people, when you say that to them, will actually feel that, let's take the chickens for example, which I said the largest number, are creatures we should respect. You know, people may just say, I've got no respect for chickens, I don't care about chickens. You know? um, and of course if they really say I don't care, then they're probably not going to care about their suffering either. But, but I think that you might get more to care about their suffering than to say, um, I respect chickens. So, you know, it depends how many Kantians you know or people who think that re respect is, is, is an important moral basis rather than um, avoiding suffering and producing 
greater well-being. And, and you think it's possible to avoid all the suffering and the leap aptly uh, being 7.6 billion people and all these companies look for is profit, they don't care about the uh, animals living. You think it's really possible to give a happy life? No, I don't think. But, but on the other hand, we don't need these animals to feed the 7.6 billion people. In fact, they're reducing the amount of available food. I also want to thank in the name of the Department of Philosophy and the Institute of Philosophy, Stephen Gobey and Diane Neva, two organizers of this wonderful event.